Um, I want to do a little brief introduction of our speaker, or the wonderful author that we are working with today. Uh, this is author, professor, and Thomas D. Peacock, member of the Fond du Lac Band of Lake Ajib Superior Ojibwe, is the co-owner and publisher of Black Bears and Blueberries Publishing, specializing in Native, Amer Native American children's books. He's born in Cloquet, Minnesota. He holds a master's and doctoral degrees in educational leadership from Harvard University. Peacock has authored or co-authored several uh, acclaimed works, including The Forever Story, The Collected Wisdom, The Seventh Generation, the latter recognized as a multicultural children's book of the year. The Wolf's Trail came out on May 2020 through the Holy Cow Press. His contributions include topics of Ojibwe history, culture, spirituality, contemporary challenges, and environmental stewardship, um, identity, belonging, traditions, resilience, education, racism, and community. Thomas resides in Little Sand Bay, Red Cliff, Wisconsin, um, Duluth, Minnesota, and currently in Florida. So he has got the best view right now, I think, out his window that we all have. Uh, but he showed me and I wasn't too jealous. So hopefully you guys could all be happy that you have the view of us today. The book that we are focusing on today is The Wolf's Trail. It unfolds as a collection of interlinked tales narrated by wolves, weaving a fictional narrative around the Ojibwe people. Rooted in the seven grandfather, seven fire teachings, this book delves into the various facets of Ojibwe culture and history. And each chapter centered around Tiche, an elder wolf, a spirit, a spirit litter of young wolves, the story imparts timeless life lessons to the wolf pups. Well, I would love it, Thomas, if you could start, start um, with telling us about yourself a bit more, maybe something I missed, also about pu your publishing house. Um, that I think is a great place to start, if you wouldn't mind. Sure. I'll go ahead and start. I'll introduce myself in my language. That's okay. Tom Peacock, I'm I'm beaming in from Bradenton, Florida today. We spend a couple months of the year here. And uh, yeah, I, uh, my wife and I, uh, Betsy, are co-publishers of uh, Black Bears and Blueberries Publishing. It's a, it's a little uh, company that we started uh, after we retired uh, from uh, UM Duluth. We were teaching in the education department there for a million and a half years, I think. And uh so um, we sat around twiddling our thumbs for about a year and a half. And then I said to her, I said, how'd you like to start a publishing company? Because, you know, as educators, we noticed that there was um, really a lack of of good culturally appropriate books, especially for, for children. And, um, and so that's primarily what we've been doing, although we've published uh, an art book and an anthology and, and that kind of thing. And it looks like we're going to be publishing another anthology. Uh, collection of native writers. We publish native writers and we also utilize uh, native illustrators. I believe we've published 50 books, um, which is a lot. Um, most of our customers are schools and uh, all over uh, the place. Um, and um, you name it, um, our books are sold all over the country and and um, it's become more than a part-time job, actually. It's, um, it's keeping us hopping, keeping us young. So uh, that's, uh, that's where I'll start with, with that little publishing thing. And you can ask all kinds of questions and tell me to shut up and sit down and ask questions. And so go for it. Well, I will tell you right now, I will not tell you to shut up. I am excited to hear you today. After reading your book, I was just so inspired to look at other works that you've done and look forward to further reading. Can you talk to me about your experience as a professor and that how in, that impacts your writing, specifically choosing to write fiction or nonfiction? And maybe just like, how did you get to use your imagination as the combination of research and history into sure. this book specifically? Oh, sure. So, um, so this started a little early, maybe before I, before I became a, you know, went into academia, because um, when I first got out of college, undergrad, um, 
and moved back to my reservation. I, I decided I was going to go out and I was going to interview uh, elders. And uh, this was a long time ago. This was like 50 years ago. And, uh, and at that time, I went out and we did uh, multiple interviews of like 23 different elders. Some of them were done in Ojibwe uh, because they didn't speak the, uh, English. You know, and um, and um, we used, um, at that time, we used some of the daughters because these were elderly people who were, many of them living in the homes of their daughters and their families. And um, so I was interested in gathering at that time a community history. So I, I've always had that interest in history. I was trained as an American history teacher. You know, history is my, social studies is my uh, undergraduate degree. And um, so I had that that interest early on. So, so you know, you kind of fast forward, you know, an, an, another half million years, and I end up, um, you know, accepting a job at, at UMD after, you know, 20 some years in K-12, you know, either as a teacher or a school administrator. Um, but when I went into higher ed, um, in, in graduate school, um, we use the case study method and, um, in many of my courses and, and case studies are, you know, those of you who know a little bit about case studies, they're complex um, uh, readings um, that, that look at issues from multiple perspectives, you know, financial and, and maybe a, there's a case uh, of sort of a fictional story that goes along with it. And I ended up teaching a course called Teaching American Indian Children. Uh, it was one of the courses that I taught uh, there at UMD, and and I thought, well, you know, some of these young people, they're going to go out and they're going to end up teaching in schools where there are significant Native populations, and 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 I really have no way to give them context um, for the situations or f for the what they're going to find out there. And some of them, of course, are going to take jobs in tribal schools and on reservations where, you know, they're really going to get thrown into the fire because they don't know anything about Native people. And, uh, and I thought, well, maybe one way to do that was to use a case study method. And so case, that's what I did. I, I wrote a series of cases, um, cases that actually are short stories, you know, that, that put, um, you know, the situations that teachers face with Native parents and, and with Native kids and, and stories of Native kids and put it into that kind of context. So they can, at least from a fictional perspective, make them as real as possible. So that's how I started the fiction, you know, because like a lot of people, I I started um, I started writing poetry and I was submitting poetry, you know, quite a bit of my life and, um, you know, getting either getting accepted or rejected, you know, into those small reviews all over uh, the country. So, but anyway, that's how it got started, uh, the fictional part of it anyway. And any thoughts around how you had to use your imagination to move forward into this writing? Well, um, I um, I was raised in a in a native home, and I, I I say that because you know I come from a family of thirteen kids, and um, and and when I was um, young, um, in in many of the native homes back then, um, when company had come over, um, the kids were all all the kids were kind of put in one room, you know, to play. And it was at a time when when young people did not interrupt adults. Um, you, you know, you automatically, if you're sent into a room uh, and told to play quietly, that's kind of what you did. Um, uh, things have totally changed in that regard. Um, but I was kind of the kid who was laying on the floor um, right next to the open door, um, listening to all those stories. So I, I've always had an interest in in that, in listening to story. And uh, and that's that's kind of where that came from, and so I heard all my um, all my grandparents and aunties and uncles all of their all of their stories, and um, and so um, that's that's kind of where it started. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about that creative process in a, uh, uh, in a bit because. Um, you know, you might think I'm absolutely crazy, but those of you who are writers, I think are creative writers might understand that process, but it is a little bizarre. That's all I can tell you. 
I'll do my best to remember to ask you that because I would love to know more. And especially if you think it's bizarre, that I think makes it even more fascinating for all of us. Um, this book, this book is such a wonderful one. I read it. I was, I was saying on my Kindle, you were saying that it was hard, hard to access a printed copy. Sometimes I was like, thankfully it's endless on, uh, on the Kindle version. Um, when we were having a discussion group, we were, we were talking about the idea of, uh, how valuable it would be to have the audio of it. Any thoughts out there on having it, uh, created into an audio so people could listen to it that maybe don't have as much access or, or maybe would be slowed down by the reading. Yeah, we've, we've been asked to do that. Um, and, um, and I think that'll come eventually. I, I do. Um, some of the children's books that I've written, um, we've put on YouTube. So, um, and of course, they're easy because maybe they're like 800 words. So they're not, you know, 60,000 words like the Wolf Trail. Um, but yeah, we there's been a, some discussion of that. And, and we'd like to make that uh, possible for, for, you know, people who, you know, are, you know, who, who would prefer it in, you know, that, in that way. So, yeah, that's all I can tell you right now. There's not been nothing firm done on it, but we've certainly talked about it. Well, if it becomes an audio, you'll have to let us know. Keep, keep yeah. us looped in because I think we would love to all be listening to this. I think there's such value in hearing um, the words said, uh, especially when you, when you're maybe exploring a language that you're maybe not as fully familiar with. Um, yeah because we know we do a little bit of weird things when we pronounce things in our own heads uh, that the words don't necessarily always match the way they actually sound in real life. Uh, so that'll be exciting. Um, that goes to who is the intended audience for this? We were talking about what age is this meant for? It, yeah. We had people in the room that were all ages when we were doing our discussion. And I also have talked to uh, somebody that said that they read it to their, their child. Um, and I was starting to read it to my child and thought, gosh, this is wonderful, but I, turns out I read too slowly for me to get through a book, uh, to read it all to her out loud, to start out with, at least when I'm trying to get it done in a month. Uh, but what are your thoughts? Who is it for? Well, um, yeah, you know, because I've done a range of different genre in terms of writing, um, when I do fiction, uh, particularly fiction that's in, uh, uh, that's, well, I don't know if I can call the Wolf's Trail native fiction, but but it does tell that parallel story of wolves and the Ojibwe. And so it is based on story and it's based on some of it based on historical fact. But specifically with that kind of fiction, I'm writing for a native audience. Um, and, and so I write in uh, res English. Um, so these wolves, um, not only do they speak and understand Ojibwe, they they also um, speak in reservation English. So. Um, so I'm writing primarily for a Native audience. I, I know that most of my readership are non-Native, um, but um, it, it, it can offer a window into that world as well, you know? Um, so uh, in terms of grade level, you know, I, I, um, I, I, I put it at a reading level that, um, that most people can understand. It's at about a fourth, fifth grade reading level. Um, my wife, uh, who's my first editor, takes out all the vulgarity out of it when I, out of all the drafts that I do, and, and to make sure that it's you know that everything that I write is G or PG rated, um, uh, because uh, sometimes I get a little carried away. Um, uh, you know, writing is a process where it brings out all of your emotions, and so um, you know it bring uh, like when i'm writing something that is gleeful or happy you know that that's that's what i'm feeling at the time if there's something um that is um that is difficult um that's sad or that uh, where there's anger uh, i i'm feeling that as i'm writing it so so all of that kind of comes out in in the writing but yeah the writing is um the book itself is intended for middle school on up and i know that um, it's it's had uh, seventh and eighth grade. Uh, it's been read in in uh, at that grade level, and and it's being read, I guess, by many many adults as well. So yeah, so there we go. I love that. I know that when we were talking about it, I thought, wouldn't this be a wonderful one for uh, those that go to Wolf Ridge? There's so many youth, I think, in sixth grade or something like that, that all go to Wolf Ridge, and what a wonderful book this would be if if everybody that went there, um, these whole cl classes of kids would be reading it and then exploring uh, out in nature, and then also having that when they're thinking about um, the wolves that they maybe are interacting with. 
The story was filled with a wide range of emotions and human wolf experiences. Can you talk to me about your use of humor in the book? I know I really appreciated it. Yeah, I, I, um, well, I, I have, um, I have that, uh, that res sense of humor. Um, I really do. And I, you know, that's why I was raised on the res. And I, my wife said that um, when I'm talking to somebody from back home, that I slip right into that lingo again and into that humor. Um, and we do have a, a, a very uh, kind of a, a survival humor. It's uh, it's kind of jaded, um, um, but that's kind of what it is. But I think when you're dealing with, especially when you're dealing with difficult things, I always I always make a point of putting humor in there um, to to try to balance it out a little bit, you know, because the story of the Ojibwe, the the history of you know Native people, and and then the difficulties that our communities. Um, um, any member of members of our communities you know, that they have to live in today and experience today, you know, that can be really difficult. And um, the same would go for wolves uh, because of that parallel story. Um, they, you know, they've had a very difficult time, and and uh, you need to, you need to put you need to put humor in into that. And so I do, you know, and I do it consciously, you know. And sometimes I do get playful, and so some, you know, occasionally you'll have a chapter that's that's very playful, in terms of that. So yeah, I do it on purpose. One of the only things I do on purpose, I think. So. Well, it was appreciated, and I think especially uh, helpful if you're trying to invite younger readers in. I think uh, humor is something that they very much appreciate. Can you talk to me about building the book around the seven grandfather, seven fire? Uh, teachings based on wisdom, respect, honesty, humility, truth, bravery, and most important, love. Um, how that was chosen and and what that plays into the story. Well, of course, um, you know those those um, seven teachings. Um, you know they have a whole story to it them, themselves. Um, that you know that's been told in other other writings. Um, uh, and uh, and their their values that uh, are ways of looking at life that are stressed. Um, you know, in our in our schools, our tribal schools in particular, and in our ceremonies, uh, the, all the various different teachings, and 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 when I thought about, well, how can I construct a story like this? I had done a book a few years ago called Beginnings: um, The Homeward Journey of Donovan Manny Penny, and in that case, I built um, the story around um, the migration. Uh, from the westward migration, so I, I built it around the seven uh, stopping uh, places of the migration of the Anishinaabe people from the from the Eastern Ocean and until they reached, um, you know, Madeline Island, and um, and so this one when I when I uh, started, you know, thinking about the story, I thought, well, then how, uh, what can I build it around uh, beside that parallel relationship that exists you know, between humans and wolves. And that's when I decided to use the grandfather teachings um, in, in so many ways, they're universal. And um, so, yeah, that's kind of what happened. I, I have to tell you that when I build a story, I, um, I, don't, I, don't, uh, I don't outline it at all. I really don't. Um, um, I, uh, I don't consciously. The, I was thinking consciously that you know I, I'm going to use these grandfather teachings somehow, but um, um, that's kind of always in the back of my head. Um, but um, when I build a story, I might just have like uh, a couple of words I'll, I'll write down, um, and then uh, and then the story just kind of writes itself. If that makes any sense. I do. I don't have an, an outline. Well, that okay. kind of deeps in, deepens into the next question I was going to ask. I really appreciate the intro at each chapter, that sort of page or two pages that you had that told some other history or uh, shared a little background in a different way. Um, and did you have those? Did you have to find those? How did that work? Uh, well, and did you choose what those were going to be? Well, I, I, you know, I'm not a, an expert in, uh, although I've written, I think, four or five uh, books on Ojibwe history and culture and that kind of thing, you know, nonfiction books. Um, I, I don't consider myself an expert in that at all. I, 
I think um, most of that is from, uh, you know, from 50 some years of interviewing people and, and reading and that kind of thing. I don't have a background in American Indian studies or anything like that. It's just a, that interest in culture and an interest in history. And, and uh, what happens is, um, uh, believe it or not, um, that part, you know, that, that connection either to culture or to history is, uh, is added after, a, after the story is, after that chapter is written. So I, I try to think of what that connection is going to be uh, after I read the chapter about 20 times doing my editing. So I was thinking back it's to the, a random process. I was thinking back to the part that um, you were telling the personal story about um, reading the letter that your great, great grandmother wrote. Did you have that before? Was that something that that was hard to share personally with the public? It, it was no, that wasn't hard to share because what happened was this was like in 1993. I, I was, uh, I was doing, um, you know, my history research, and I had spent a summer at the out in Washington D.C. at the National Archives, and I, I spent um, that summer out there. I didn't know anybody, um, and uh, I went like a almost a whole summer without really speaking to anybody except for the librarian. I noticed my voice was even. Um, nearly, I don't know, I can't even describe it from not even being used. And, um, and when you, if you, if you've ever done any work in the archives, you know, you register and then you, 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 you look at, you know, their records and, and you ask for certain files and um, they bring you these carts of files. And it just so happened when I opened, you know, that second file folder, out of you know the thousands of file folders that I looked at um, in that particular area, um, you know, I got about halfway through the letter and I realized that the person who was writing the letter was my great grandmother, and I did. I I became very emotional. I I began weeping um, because I realized, um, you know, the horrible position that you know our people were in at that time. Um, um, you know where where mothers and and grandmothers and had to you know give their children up and they didn't have any say in it, you know. So um, yeah, it was a very emotional moment for me. So yeah, I included a copy of that letter, I believe, in uh, in a book I did. Uh, uh, you know, Ojibwe Wasa and Abida. We look in all directions. Uh, a copy of that actual letter. A little personal, but had your family had any knowledge of any of that before you had seen the letter? No, no, because my great grandmother had died in the Spanish flu, um, and uh, and um, she died um, she died that winter um, before she wrote the letter, or after she wrote the letter, um, and uh, that was the first pandemic that came through killed about half the people in my reservation, or 50% of the population. Um, yeah. And uh, it turns out that, you know, back then there weren't a lot of people who were literate and there were people who like, wrote letters for everybody. And uh, she had gone to uh, Carlisle to the Indian school out in Pennsylvania. And uh, and she, uh, she was like one of those community letter writers. She had beautiful penmanship. So yeah, so hard to have so much of the history lost too, and yeah. gaining it back, you know, in pieces. Yeah, and not having complete stories. Yeah, not having complete stories, and you know, as a historian, and when I started doing Ojibwe history, I, you know, I got in a little bit of trouble every once in a while because, um, because you try to piece together, you know, what is there, and uh, sometimes you're only getting like one version of the truth. There are usually truth is multi-dimensional and in whose version of the truth are you hearing and history is that way in particular um you know there are many many versions of of historical events or cultural events or or stories you know traditional stories um, there are different versions of those as well so i'd get every once in a while somebody would corner me and say hey you know you you kind of told that story a little wrong uh, you know that kind of thing so 
And then I'd say, well, you know, um, you know, you're probably right. Um, uh, uh, but somebody else told me the, the version that I put in there. You know what I mean? And I'm not saying who's right or who's wrong, but that's one of the really super difficult things that you have to do when you write history is you have to decide what's going to get printed because for some crazy reason in our society, once something is written, um, many people accept it as fact, you know, and it becomes the truth rather than just one version of it. Sometimes the version of history that you hear is from the person who lives the longest, you know, and somebody goes out and, and interviews them. It's their version of the truth. Like, and to my perspective, you wouldn't want to not have even that version out there. I mean, in yeah. the weight of uh, everybody's story or everybody's piece. Yeah. I know I've heard that some with learning the Anishinaabe Moan language too, that depending on where you are, who learned it and how they learned it, yeah. uh, you look at different pieces of that. Oh, yeah. um, I'm going to read off a couple of questions there in the chat, and then I'll get back to some of the other questions I have as well. Uh, why does a wolf pack need an omega wolf? Um, you know, um, I think it's it's varied because um, what I um, it depended upon you know what I was um, uh, what I had read because I it had to, I had to do a little bit of research um, um, into wolf social behavior, and so. Uh, and don't ask me what the name is of the books that I read or the videos that I watched, but I had to do quite a bit of it. And um, and then uh, what I did was I um, after I wrote the story, I um, I gave a copy of the manuscript to Mike Schloss, uh, the the who manages the wolf uh, population uh, for my reservation. Uh, there are five wolf packs on Fond du Lac, and I said, you know, am I just talking crap here, or is you know, is there any truth to this? And um, um, and so he he read it and, because I wanted to make sure that, I mean, any time that you create fictional characters and you give them human voice and human emotions and human intentions, you know, you're not going to capture, um, you know, what what that animal character is really like. Um, but you're, you're, but I wanted to capture it as much as possible, and 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 uh, so I asked him to do that, and he made several uh, kind of big edits to it as as he as he went through it, and, and he didn't touch that part about a, you know, about a, you know, the the master sort of wolf, um, because um, the literature, um, some of it says that you know there are packs that don't have that, and some that do. And um, that's, you know, that's what I was getting. So uh, I wasn't sure where to go with it, but I went with that that one and he didn't beat me up. The Like I say, Mike didn't beat me up on that one. He didn't say, take that out. There were a couple of things that, uh, they were just basic things that, that he corrected me on. Uh, one I had, there's a part of the story where Jishé and, and, um, and, um, you know, youngest nephew and little niece, um, they make that journey east um, to toward, uh, uh, you know, toward Redcliffe, toward, um, um, you know, the Echo Valley pack uh, where the little boy is um, uh, when they're making that journey uh, where they, uh, cro I had initially written in the manuscript that they had, they were crossing the Oliver Bridge. Um, you know, that's kind of south, south of Duluth. And uh, Mike said, you know, um, he he put a big circle around that part of the story. And he said, you know, wolves will never cross the bridge. He said, they'll swim the river. And um, so he fixed that part. And then uh, I had another part where um, where the wolves were kind of, they would kind of suffer in the wintertime uh, from, uh, from the lack of food. And he said, no, that's a great time for them because they run on top of the snow. And you know, and uh, and the deer kind of sink in, so it's it's, it's good pickings in. <laughs> so anyway, no, no it's fascinating. Yeah. Well, yeah. so um, in, in in your story, you talk about the original man, original uh, wolf, Aki. Um, in the Anishinaabe culture, wasn't a wolf a friend partner to the first Anishinaabe? Is what people somebody asked. Could you talk a little bit about that part of the story? Well, that part of the story, um, uh, the naming of a key, um, 
I, I'm actually, I've actually put that into a children's story and it's coming out next year as a children's book uh, called The Naming of a Key. When, when first human, it's going to be an illustrated children's book that Minnesota Historical Society is publishing. And uh, where, um, where first wolf and first human uh, go out and name all things. And that is, uh, you know, part of our creation story. And, um, you know, where, where they go ahead and do that. And so... Uh, I had the the really fun job of putting that to fiction. So, yeah. Yeah, I thought you did a wonderful job uh, introducing it and weaving it through the rest of the book um, and being able to follow along that that concept. Uh, how does the book follow Wolf's social behavior, the concept of being a watcher, the value of observation? Can you talk about the decision to have that be so fundamental to the, to the book, being a watcher for the concept of that, uh, observation? Yeah. I had to build in um, uh, the idea of that because um, um, those of you who are um, are, are are dog owners, um, Anamush, um, uh, know that um, dogs, um, you know, they have that wolf ancestry. Um, um, that that our dog companions spend all of their time observing human behavior. Um, they really do. I mean, they know us so well. Um, uh, because um, they spend uh, a great deal of their waking time uh, watching us. And so I built that watcher into that that story. I also built it in because, um, you know, because uh, the wolves are concerned uh, what's happening to us. They're concerned about the Ojibwe. And they're, they're concerned about, you know, what, what, what we're up to and, and, you know, of our survival culturally and spiritually. Um, um, and, uh, and so um, there needs to be uh, that kind of character built in to ensure that they know what's going on with us. And so I built, built that in that way. Yeah. Yeah. I thought you did such a nice job also talking about um, when Shay was talking about how he could, was thinking about how humans observe wolves, but not wanting to frighten the nephews and niece about that um, because it wasn't necessarily in the same kind of maybe neutral way or, or yeah. uh, same way. Uh, I was also struck by the idea of the management of humans and animals through both the intention of love, care with the concept of like good, like we're doing intended good management. Uh, thoughts on how those positions of power that manage the care of people or animals how they can go well or wrong i'd probably need a little context for that question Maybe yeah the, just was thinking about um as we look at the stories of of the government involvement in the Ojibwe story and then also as we look at now potential uh productive bit management of wolves or also the concerns around um you know allowing wolf hunts or not allowing wolf hunts and yeah. how it becomes a decision that people are making. Um, yeah. Well, I, th I think, you know, a lot of this has to do with that fundamental, there's a fundamental uh, difference in thinking uh, between Ojibwe people and, and um, you know, like the state of Minnesota, you know, natural resources departments and, and that kind of thing, or U.S. Forestry Service or, you know, that kind of thing, because, you know they have a ten the the non native has a tendency to look at um look at these things as resources to be managed and um and I don't know if you've ever noticed so I think probably everyone has has noticed but um you know on our reservation communities whenever the states begin talking about wolf hunts they will always oppose it um because of that strong cultural connection so so our our ojibwe people would would think completely don't think of of these or animals as we would call them as resources you know um in a traditional sense there are elder there are elder relatives and so in our in our job, um, one of the reasons that we were put on this earth, a key, is to watch over that, is to tend 
to that beautiful garden that is a key, that is Mother Earth. And that's a, that's a fundamental difference in thinking than looking on it as a resource to be managed. Does that make sense? It does. Thank you. I appreciate that perspective. Um, the bundles and scrolls, I, I didn't know about that component of the, of the story before I read your book. Um, and also, I did not know about the uniqueness of the Ojibwe having a migration story versus other places. Uh, is there other things that those are things were new to me? Um, I knew the scroll of the connection to Red, not of the connection to Red Cliff, just that scrolls existed. Um, do you think that the history you added allows a book and people to access history that may not have learned about it before or may not have remembered that they learned about it, um, maybe gave new, new details? I thought especially focusing on Minnesota, mm -hmm. there were so many things I learned. Well, um, uh, let me say something about the scrolls and the little boy, um, because um, that's where I really had to build fiction because, you know, um, the scrolls, of course, um, are part of our cultural history and part of our prophecy. So so that's always been a part of, you know, there's always been a teaching about that. Um that that when um that when our our you know when our traditional people when our when they saw you know what was happening to us and what you know what was happening with with our that contact with non-native culture um that they they took those scrolls those teachings um and 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 they did they did they, they put them in you know on an ironwood log and they they covered it and they they hid it somewhere in caves and and um and then uh, the story says that um that someday a little boy is going to find them um and uh and and so that you know that story is is a is really a, a very traditional teaching and um but I had to, um, I want you to think about it a little differently um, because um, um, in the, uh, in ceremony, um, uh, the, the water drum is little boy. Um, you know, uh, before you enter the lodge and you, you put down, you know, your tobacco at the grandfather's at the, you know, the rock. Um, uh, and then the water drum that's used in uh, in in ceremony, um, that's referred to as little boy. So you might think of um, you might think of little boy symbolically. That uh, so I had so I had to. That's why I really had to get into fiction because um, because I actually created a little, a little boy. Okay, and I thought maybe um, you know. Um, uh, that I I thought you know because I took our truth our our truth, and and fictionalized it to actually create a little boy, um, that I might get into a little bit of trouble with some of our traditional people with that one. Um, but um, uh, it's one of the cool things about being seventy some years old, I guess. Uh, <laughs> it's that twenty years ago I wouldn't have been able to get away with that. Well, with that being said, was there any response to the book that um, that really helped support your feelings about the creation of it from um, the Ojibwe or Indigenous uh, regional people? I I think um, you know uh, um, when I started doing this a long time ago, either this book or or the other books that I've done, I've seen um, a lot of things that I've written about become common knowledge and. Uh, in uh, in our Ojibwe country, and that's the most wonderful. Um, if I have a legacy of any kind, I think um, you know um, I was one of the first people to write about um, um, you know uh, um, Wisconsin Point, and um, and now you know my reservation um, has you know gotten back that land, Wisconsin Point, and then. Um, you know, the knowledge of when uh, they, the, our ancestors made that sixth stop at the migration um, and, and met out there on Spirit Island, you know, where, you know coming out of Saint, into the, the Lake Superior and St. Louis Bay. Um, you know, that, that, was not, that, was not, that was knowledge known by people who, 
you know, who know our traditional stories, uh, but it wasn't common knowledge. And when I put that, started putting that story into books, and then, you know, so today you see, you know, um, that my reservation has has gotten back Spirit Island, you know, so that's just like common knowledge now, and just to, and um, so so it just feels wonderful, and and to be able to now that I've moved into fiction, um, to build history and culture into fiction, um, you know, um, all of this kind of what few people used to know now. Um, you know, they teach it in kindergarten and first grade and all the way up through. So it's that that feels really wonderful. You know, that 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 they're learning they're learning this. And um yeah. Yeah, I think that as um there's more common knowledge, it becomes more accessible. But I think there's also uh the importance of making sure that sovereign nations have the decision making over. Um, what is more public knowledge? How does that play into the decision of of sharing information? Um, those are things that you do keep closer that are not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There is. Um, I think. Um, I think somebody had made that observation many years ago with, um, with with some of Maya Angelou's um, fiction, with some of her writing. They, they somebody had mentioned that. Um, from from her community that you're you're telling all our secrets, and uh, you need to be careful. And I, it's the same way that I feel is that I have to. There are certain things that I won't write about. Um, I'll give you an example. It's kind of a funny example. I did a book many years ago called The Good Path, and uh, and it's written at a middle school level, and it's about it's kind of about uh, a way of living, uh, Ojibwe kind of a way of living, and I wrote it for young people and middle school age and uh, and in it um, I talked about um, uh, one of the things I talked about was um, how a long time ago uh, the young people in our community used to uh, um, uh, pierce their noses and put like fur in their noses um, uh, and and that was kind of the in thing so anyway I put that in my um, I put that in the book and then when my wife Betsy read it she says you know she says you know, if you leave that in that book, every kid out on the res is going to have a pierced nose with fur in their nose, and you don't want to start that. So, <laughs> so anyway, she edited that part out of it. And there's so you know that's a humorous thing, but there are other things that you know we've had to take out every once in a while. Yeah, I'm, probably the importance of having multiple readers, right? To yeah, um, yeah. to through the lens. Um, Complicated nature of history of wolves, dogs, and humans. What can we do here locally to better to impact the narrative around coexistence potentially? Any thoughts on that? Well, I think that um, I think that uh, what we're seeing um, is a um, sort of a, a mainstream kind of movement um, of non-native people interested in native people, uh, native existence. Um, because I think maybe maybe there's something missing in a, in American culture, mainstream American culture that that uh, they can't get uh, or that they can only get um, by knowing something about Native people. Um, and I've noticed that over my lifetime um, because you know ever since I was a little kid, I've been going to powwows. It's just as an example, and and it used to be that you know just the traditional people went to powwows and then. And then um, in ceremony, um, and then uh, uh, as I got a bit older, um, you begin seeing like regular old native people at them and it was pretty much all native people. Um, but gee, nowadays when you go to a powwow, about half the people there will be non-native, you know? And uh, so you, you see that um, whatever it is that um, they're looking for, um, they're finding in that, in our story. And um, and so um, whatever that is, that connection, um, that connection to um, the natural world, um, whatever that is, yeah. I think you make the good point about the good path, right? Like the people are trying to maybe figure that out yeah. and using this as a tool. Um, 
as I'm looking at uh, my questions, we're getting closer to the end of time. So I want to make sure we get through a couple of them that are uh, important to highlight. The cover of the book is beautiful. Who created the cover? How did you pick it? Uh, yeah. And uh, tell me more about that. Hey, I did a Google image search. That's what I did. And I bought the original. And uh, so, yeah, uh, artist of Madison, Wisconsin, uh, non-native. Um, um, I'm a big uh, lover of... Um, of the um, um, of the impressionists, and um, that was in the impressionist style, you know, Van Gogh, Starry Night, with that Starry Night with a wolf in it, and uh, and I thought it was just perfect. So um, when I found it, I um, I um, I uh, got got a hold of the artist somehow and uh, and bought the original and used it as a cover. So I have the original. Yeah. And where does it hang? Which house? It um it hangs uh well I'm not saying we had we uh, <laughs> how's that well no we have we it's hanging uh it, it's good it's hanging in our place in uh out on the res and cloquets. So yeah. Well, I'm sure it's another beautiful view for you to look at when you are back there. Yeah. In the book, the nephew and uncle at times share about what makes a good leader. Is this in this somewhat divisive time, what do you think makes for a good leader? Um, well, um, uh, oh, my wife has given me hand signals, so I don't, I don't know what that means. <laughs> sure, I, I'm sure I'm going. It's to like it's a trick question. Watch out! No. Yeah. yeah. Well, um, uh, at least from my perspective, because I look on things a little bit differently. Um, uh, a, a good leader um, steps back when, rather than steps stepping forward, um, and make sure that make sure that everyone else's voice is heard before um, they speak. And um, um, uh, so, um, I know that in our traditional societies that, and I really believe that this is the direction that, at least as Native people, that we have to go. Um, that um, um, there was a time when we, uh, in our traditional societies, where we were egalitarian, and and um, and decisions um, were made uh, in our villages um, through consensus, and uh, and we've built um, our political models around the American um, uh, system, which has you know like. Uh, a stratification of leadership and where we, you know, we have that kind of system in place, but I'm, you know, at least in my, um, um, in, in my thinking, uh, there was a time where um, leadership was something that wasn't, wasn't sought. Um, so, and the leaders, there were leaders for certain things, depending upon their expertise. So there were, if if someone was good at making war, then they became the leader at leading war. If someone um, was good at hunt, the hunt, um, then they became the leaders of the hunt. Um, if they were uh, good at giving, if they were, uh, when, uh, when the Europeans and the Americans first came, if they were good, if they picked up the English language, then they became the leader at communicating with non-native people. So that's the way that I would look at it. And I think that's a traditional way of looking at it. Um, at least from my perspective, the, the, the governmental systems that we've set up in our communities are in conflict with our traditional values. And, um, and I'm thinking that eventually, um, um, they will change, and and eventually, um, probably not in our lifetimes, um, we'll go back to that traditional um, way of of uh, leading. Well, thank you for that. So, I just have a couple last questions before I encourage the audience to put in um, some more questions in chat, or I'll have time for you to unmute. Uh, how do we help promote your book? Other Indigenous authors encourage more Indigenous authors to be published, and for the books to have good sales. Hey. Um, good question. Um, uh, 
you know, with a little publishing company that we started, uh, we didn't realize it was going to go crazy. Um, it's become more than a full-time job. And we probably put in 60, 80 hours a week uh, doing this. And my wife is a marketing person. I tell her that I scare people away. I can't sell books um, because I'm too scary looking. So uh, she's just a master at it um, and has been very good at it. You know, I, I think the way to, the, the, at least what we've done is, is um, you know, we've gone out and, and sought out uh, Native writers and given them a venue, uh, a publication venue, because mainstream publishers um, need that volume in order to make money. And, uh, and I think what we've done is we've been able to, uh, because we print in small batches, um, and, uh, and uh, most of our writers are, were first-time authors, um, and several of them uh, have gone on to bigger and better uh, much bigger and much better. Uh, as an example, Teresa. Looks like it's frozen up for a second. Hopefully it comes back. Am I still frozen? Nope, you're back now. Am I back? Yeah. I'm back. I saw that. Am I, oh, am I still there? You're there. You're doing good. Okay. You were, you were just saying that uh, somebody's name, and then you stopped. Oh yeah, yeah. Teresa Peterson would be an example of that. She, she, she was one of the first books that we published. Maybe the first one that we published called Grasshopper Girl, and it was tr it's a traditional Dakota story. But she's gone on and written a couple more books, um, and uh, and the um, you know her her latest book that she did with her uncle Super, you know, is selling thousands and thousands. Um, and, uh, and she's, she's writing another one and, and we have another writer from the Minneapolis community. Um, you know, um, she's gone on to pub, uh, with other companies, gone on to publish about six other books and, and, uh, um, another example would be, uh, the Grand, in, from Grand Portage area, Grand Marais area, um, Sam Zimmerman, we published his art book. And uh, and I think he's he's gone on. He's doing a, He's already published one other book, and and I think he's coming out with another one. And of course, his art is all over Grand Marais. So um, yeah, I think he well, painted all the garbage cans in Grand Marais. Yes, aren't they beautiful? Yeah. yeah. I heard rumor that maybe giving some good reviews and uh, getting them as good holiday gifts to give away, and yeah. all of those things are are other ways to encourage that. And maybe other communities taking them on as community reads uh, yeah. might be a good way to encourage sales. Yeah. And with that being said, I hear you may be working on another book. What book are you working on? Well, um, uh, I have a I have a book. I I, I think uh, it might be out the end of April. Of course, it never works out that way, right? Um, uh, it's a um, how can I describe it? It's a boarding school love story now, um, now i've tried all different kinds of books in my life i've done quite a few ojibwe history kinds of things and academic books and poetry and short stories and uh you know all of that kind of thing uh, but in the back of my head i was i've always wanted to do a love story and so what i did was i set a love story uh, within the context of uh, of the indian boarding schools and so I I uh, I came up with this um, with the sister school Saint Mary's Mission um, is located in uh, Granite Falls, Minnesota. It's fictitious. I didn't want to use uh, Flandreau, you know, the Indian school in Flandreau, and I didn't want to use Pipestone uh, School uh, boarding school. I, did, I had to make something up, so I made up Saint Mary's. My both my wife's uh, uh, dad and my dad. Uh, both were sent to St. Mary's Mission, uh, a boarding school in Odina, Wisconsin, when they were young. And uh, they were both uh, forced to go there. And, uh, and so this is, a, this is a, that one. And, and I came up with two characters, um, Simon Pendegayash. And uh, I just love that those old fashioned names, uh, Ojibwe name in the end there, and, uh, and Carolina Shagabe. Are the, are the two, uh, 
you know, the two main characters in this story. Um, they meet. Um, um, Carolina is is uh, fourteen, and Simon is thirteen. Um, they're both sent, you know, from different parts of the state to there, and they fall in love. It uh, it's set in the nineteen fifties, um, um, about nineteen fifty seven. They um, uh, uh, the kinds of abuse, of course, that were happening in the boarding schools, um, you know, all during that that time. Um, um, uh, it it uh, it's a story of how. Uh, their love and um, that abuse uh, sort of uh, uh, impacted the trailer of their lives. And so there is a, uh, it follows their, their, their life paths. Uh, there'll be a Simon chapter and a Carolina chapter, and a Simon chapter and a Carolina chapter. And that's the way the, the story progresses. So um, it's going to be called In Whispers. And, uh, and I got the, the, the um, the title from uh, uh, I was uh, my uh, I was talking with a with a a, a woman from Bemidji and uh, about the story, and she said, you know, um, when uh, when my she said when my mother and aunties um, get together, um, they they sit in a circle, uh, and they 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 put their heads really close to each other, and that's the only time that they speak their language. Um, and uh, and they they speak it in whispers um, because when they were in in boarding schools they weren't allowed to speak and um, and so they had to whisper it and and here they are you know like in their eighties and nineties and and they're uh, that 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 still impacts their lives and so you hear a lot of people who are language speakers um, when they're talking to each other they'll be doing the same thing. And so, yeah, so the title of the story. The, the name Carolina I took from uh, the movie and um, uh, the book uh, Where the Crowd Ends Sing. Uh, the lead song is a Taylor Swift song, uh, Carolina, for that, from that movie. So I just love the name Carolina, so. I love that too. Um, we're getting to the end of the time, so I know some people are going to head out for us, but I know that we also have a couple of questions in the chat and those that might want to unmute themselves and ask questions. So I'm going to have us do all of those as those are thinking about unmuting yourself. Uh, please be thoughtful to not talk on top of each other if possible. But I want to ask this last question uh, before we get into that. What books or other resources would you recommend to learn more about Ojibwe culture and teachings, especially related to wolves? And if you don't have that off the top of your head, if you have any that you want to email or I'll email that to them as a follow up. Okay. Yeah, you can go ahead and email what you found, but um, yeah, good luck. I can't help you. <laughs> How's that? Yeah. No wolves. <laughs> no wolves. Well, anything else about learning culture? I know that you've written many that, that might be helpful. Anything that um, were on the resource list for you? I know your bibliographies were tremendous, yeah. so I'm assuming your other books have those as well as yeah, a resource. Something, yeah. I think that, um, 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 I'm trying to think of his name, uh, Rabbit Runs with Horses. Um, the artist, um, the painter from uh, uh, from Red Cliff, um, uh, Wisconsin PBS, uh, did a one-hour documentary on uh, Mayangan, uh, of uh, it tells the Ojibwe a wolf thing through his art, and it's definitely worth seeing. It's it's incredibly well done. So if you type in Wisconsin uh, PBS and you um, you look for um, uh, rabbit um, Strickland or rabbit runs with horses and my Ingen, um, you'll you'll find the video on your first search of YouTube and it's uh, it's it's incredibly well done. Well, Timmy, good to everybody for coming tonight. And then I would love here if you want to unmute, you're welcome to do that. And I'll keep Thomas a little bit longer from his Florida beautifulness for a couple of questions if there's anybody that has anything. Chief Miigwech. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, good. Well, you are not going to be kept to the end, ends of the night. Uh, we've had that happen before where I've had to <laughs> cut right. people off. So uh, the gift of a little time. Anybody else have anything else? Otherwise, I want to just say thank you, Thomas. It was tremendous to learn from you. 
And I look forward to reading more of your books and going back and reading some things you've already written uh, and looking forward to your publishing house uh, and, and digging into some of your children's books, I think. What a great entry point for so many of us to be uh, gifting those or talking with our youth in the community and beyond with those at starting points. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you.